There, here we go. Uh, and we are rolling. Hi, everyone. This is Mark Goldberg with UN Dispatch. Pleased to be moderating the kickoff panel for the MDG 500. This is the 500-day countdown until the Millennium Development Goals are due. Now, if you're watching this, I assume you know what the Millennium Development Goals are. If you don't, they are the eight set of international development targets that the international community agreed to back in 2000 to be completed by 2015. And today, August 18th, is just about the 500-day countdown until they are due. Uh, so the UN Foundation has organized a day-long series of events. It's actually 500 minutes of events throughout the day, about eight and a half hours, one hour dedicated to each MDG. Uh, and we have the privilege of kicking it all off. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Michael O'Neill from the UN Development Program and Kathy Calvin from the UN Foundation to this kickoff panel. Welcome, both of you. Good morning. Uh, so, first things first, you can use the hashtag MDG Momentum to follow all the action. Uh, and if you have a question, you can hit me up on Twitter using the hashtag MDG Momentum at Mark L. Goldberg or at, uh, M or at UN Dispatch. Uh, so, uh, we're just going to jump right into it. We're going to talk, since this is the first panel, a bit about the MDGs more broadly, touch on MDG 1, uh, and then just have a, have a great conversation. So, thank you all again. Uh, and Michael O'Neill from UNDP, I'll kick it off to you to start. Uh, you're relatively new to the UN Development Program, but you've worked for the UK government for a long time and in the field of international relations for, for uh, a long and distinguished career. Uh, how did the advent of the Millennium Development Goals back in 2000 change the conversation in the international community about how uh, international development was thought of, was approached? What, what changed back in 2000? Thanks, Mark. Well, I think the, the advent of the MDGs added to other things that were going on out, outside the UN to really provide a huge amount of new momentum uh, and a framework uh, to draw attention to the challenges of international development and to help generate greater political will. So what you had with the MDGs after 2000 for the first time was a, a, a clear, relatively simple set of goals in eight areas that encapsulated many of the challenges we faced uh, to deal with poverty uh, and the related difficulties around that. So for the first time, we had a single framework that included measurable targets so that we could see what level of progress was being made, what areas we needed to put more attention into. Uh, so that helped with accountability and it helped with generating political will. It also meant that among those eight goals, you had uh, issues that may be tension. So, for example, there's obviously a big focus on ending extreme poverty and hunger, uh, but the goals also allowed more attention to be given to issues around that that are absolutely vital to make progress on those other goals. In particular, for example, issues around maternal health, child mortality, women's empowerment, you know, and a range, a range of other targets that were set. And I think as one, one indicator of uh, the progress that has allowed us to make and generate increased political will and attention. Official international development systems last year stood at $135 billion, which is the highest ever. So I think the MDGs have been hugely helpful in galvanizing attention, uh, resources, uh, and focus in terms of what we need to do. I think the, the other thing I'd say beyond that is the MDGs have provided a framework within which we developed much broader, very strong partnerships to pursue these goals. And you can see that in uh, specific areas like energy, uh, with sustainable energy for all, uh, in other initiatives such as every woman, every child. Uh, I think in terms of the international institutions, uh, the UN and the World Bank have been cooperating extremely effectively. Uh, for example, something that's going on now as we approach, you know, as we pass the 500 day point, uh, the MDG acceleration framework, which is cooperation between the bank, the UN, national governments and other partners to identify the areas and the countries where uh, we're still lagging behind and we need to do more. So I think the MDGs have transformed the debate. What we're looking at now at the 500 day point is, first of all, as I said, accelerating the progress in areas where we're still lagging, but also looking ahead to the new agenda with the sustainable development goals that we hope will be approved uh, by the United Nations General Assembly at the end of next year. And that will continue the work in areas where there's more to be done. For example, to completely end extreme poverty. You know, we've halved the rate over the last 20 years. 
but we want to get down to zero by 2030. Uh, and also putting development and ending poverty and all these essential things into an even broader context about sustainability, dealing with issues around climate. So we're on a journey that, that will continue after 2015, but I think enormous progress has been made uh, in the last 15 years uh, as a result of the NDG framework. Uh, and, and Kathy, so you know, Michael outlined the ways in which uh, MDGs inspired progress and in all sorts of different development indicators. But what, why do you think the MDGs have been such a success so far? Uh, well, you know, Michael did a great job of explaining how they came into being and how the uptake has been so significant. But you know, it's very interesting when the when the goals were first adopted by 191 countries in 2000, the selling job really had to be made not only to donor nations to support the goals but also to the countries where the work needed to be done but over time first over the first five years and over then over the next full ten years we saw countries using the goals to help set their their own plans for eradicating poverty reducing child mortality reducing maternal mortality because they had a common set of metrics by which to judge themselves and that was incredibly powerful because un until then there had been plans and there had been commitments but no common set of ways to say this is what it would look like if we were really to bring maternal mortality down by two-thirds so the ownership by countries I think was one of the most significant parts of the success of the first goals, the eight goals that have taken place over the past 15 years. I remember when Bill Gates first began work in the space when he created the Gates Foundation and they were doing so much great work on health and he was curious and kind of dismissing the, the Millennium Development Goals. He didn't really understand what, what they were or why they were important until he started traveling and he found everywhere he went that they, be, they had become the frame of reference for the conversations taking place in countries and for the uh, kinds of commitments that were being made and he became their greatest champion because he understood that if you don't have a plan you can't manage to get where you want to go so it's been great to see that and uh, we, we sometimes call it the world's to-do list because it really does lay out what we need to do to make this world a, a better place for more citizens around the world I think Michael also said a very important thing that partnerships also were a critical component so not only were the goals the UN's goals or member state goals but truly they became goals that nonprofits civil society organizations and the private sector could all buy into because again they all were driving to the same end result and could do so in partnership so it allowed all those disparate players to have a common ground to stand on and work together to get something done so we've seen some incredible partnerships and obviously some incredible progress. I mean, the amount of uh, progress we've made in reducing child mortality in particular, down 90% in things like measles, almost eradicating polio, wiping out lots of childhood uh, disease from malaria, it's been very encouraging. The maternal mortality numbers were quite lagging, and five years ago the Secretary General made that his cause, and he rallied the world behind MDG 5 and a lot has happened so um, I think we've learned a lot about the power of goals and so it's exciting that we're going into the next set of goals with some momentum today is MDG momentum day and it's taught us some lessons about what it will take for us to be successful in the next 15 years in achieving the even more ambitious and wide-ranging goals they need to cover all countries not just the poorest they need to take into account the planet, as Michael said, and they certainly need to engage every sector in our in our society and economy. Uh, so, Kathy, I want to stay with you because you mentioned something important about uh, partnerships, the role of partnerships in advancing the MDGs. You know, one of the knocks early in the MDGs was that it was sort of a closed uh, process to create the MDGs, but then a few years later, you started seeing. Uh, these groups, corporate philanthropies, NGOs, all coming together to help advance specific NG, NG, uh, goals. And one of the epicenters of these, you know, the, the public-private partnerships is the UN Foundation. Could you talk, uh, I guess, uh, uh, in a bit more detail about specific partnerships that you're involved with and how they're advancing the MDGs? 
Sure, and you know, I'll say something that I think is also really significant, and Michael should could probably come back to it. The consultations that have been done, looking ahead to the next MDGs this time around, and UNDP has led most of them. I mean, they've been regional, they've been in many, many countries, they've been thematic. It's been a wonderful thing to see all those um, areas of the world coming together to talk about the lessons learned, and the issue of partnerships has come up in almost all of them because there has been recognition that these goals do require um, cross-sector partnerships. So the one that I think is most significant, and Michael mentioned it, is the Every Woman, Every Child initiative that the Secretary General created to tackle maternal and child mortality. It required a couple things, um, bringing all of the countries together, whether they were donor nations or recipient nations, to, to create a strategy then inviting in other sectors like the private sector. So we saw great commitments by Merck, Johnson & Johnson, Becton Dickinson to help achieve the goals through a, a combination of providing, providing training, providing drugs at lower cost, some philanthropy, but frankly less about philanthropy and more about companies seeing a, a core business value that they could help make a difference around the world in some of the areas where they were most committed to trying to reduce disease and poverty. And then finally, I think what we learned was that the countries themselves became much more sophisticated about um, activating their local industries and companies. So we saw cross-sector partnerships with companies in Nigeria, companies in India, who were equally engaged in helping their own citizens get healthy. So I think we've learned a lot about partnerships. You you have to have a common ground. There has to be room for all the different assets people are bringing to the table. There has to be a framework that everybody can agree on and follow and a strategy. And there has to be adequate accountability and reporting. So all of those things have been put in place for every woman, every child. They're now being put in place for the sustainable energy for all. We now have similar partnerships around education, nutrition, and hunger. Um, <laughs> People do like to work together, so I, I, we think it's very exciting, and we also know that companies are very eager to be in on the ground floor this time with the Sustainable Development Goals. They came in a little late with the Millennium Development Goals. They're here now, and they're ready to be called on and help create what happens. The other issue that I think will be really interesting to watch is that we've identified that not only are partnerships critical, but that the way we use data the data that we have to measure how well we're doing is critical. So I think you'll see a big amount of attention and the private sector can be really helpful in making sure the data is good, it's gender and, and age disaggregated, and it's more timely. Uh, and Michael, I want to get your, your reaction to this. Um, two things. One, uh, the, the role of partnerships from your perspective in advancing the MDGs and also, as we're looking ahead in the SDGs, how have this, this concept of public-private partnerships embedded itself in the formation of the uh, forthcoming Sustainable Development Goals. Sure. Thanks, Mark. Well, I, I agree with everything that Kathy said about uh, the importance of partnerships, uh, what an exciting area that is for the future. Um, and it's worth remembering that for most uh, developing countries, uh, ODA, Official Development Assistance from Governments, represents a relatively small share of, of the income, the revenue, it is flowing into those countries. So that, I think, underlines the importance of looking more broadly at, at how we tackle the challenges of sustainable development in future. Uh, there is an absolutely vital role for official development assistance, so it's great to see that's now at its highest level ever. Uh, there are several countries that have met the, the international target of 0.7% of their income to go on assistance. Uh, we hope others can do more as they recover from the economic challenges of the last few years. But that will still only be one part of the picture. And so the role of the private sector, as Kathy said, is absolutely key. And I think as, as we look ahead at challenges, for example, in Africa, uh, access to energy, uh, sustainable energy, low carbon development, I mean, these are obviously areas where uh, the private sector has an absolutely crucial role to play. And so I think many organizations are looking at develop, developing partnerships, for example, with, with countries in the extractive sector, so oil and gas, mining, and so on. Uh, again, in many parts of Africa and other parts of the developing world, those companies have a huge role. So it's, I think it's essential that we make them part of the effort, and indeed many of those com companies want to be part of the effort. 
So I think we need to do more on that. I would just highlight um, one other uh, example or form of partnership, if you like, uh, that has really grown in the last few years and I think will be even more important in future. And that's what people often refer to as sad South cooperation. Mm -hmm. As the patterns of uh, economy and politics have changed over the last several decades, with the world's center of gravity shifting to the South and the East, it's been remarkable to see the emergence of countries really playing a role who in the past were receiving development assistance, but as they've succeeded and prospered, increasingly are looking to help others, both to learn from their own experience, uh, but also providing financial assistance. So the role of Korea is a very good example of that, uh, which is now spending about 0.2% of its income on international development, is looking to grow that to 05 You know, there are many other countries in a similar position, for example, in the Gulf. The role of China, too, has been absolutely crucial. And it's been interesting to see how China sees its own role as developing. So in the last couple of years, for the first time, they've published a white paper setting out how they want to go about international assistance, how they want to form partnerships with companies, so with countries, excuse me, in other parts of the world. So that is a very exciting new form of cooperation. And again, I, I think it really underlines uh, the value for many developing countries of learning from others who have gone through a similar experience to themselves. One, one last point I'd make, Mark, um, the, the continued role of governments, both in the, the developed world and in the developing world, in certain areas that go beyond simply providing assistance. And that is tackling issues, challenges, for example, uh, illicit financial flows. You know, many developing countries are lo losing vast amounts of revenue from money that is going out of their country improperly. So I think that's an important area for us to work together to help them strengthen their systems, uh, fill the gaps as uh, so they can prevent those illicit financial flows and keep that revenue within the country uh, for the development of health, education, opportunities for their own citizens. Um, more broadly, what's sometimes called domestic resource mobilization, helping countries, helping governments be able to raise taxes, again, to invest in their own people. There's other work that goes on in related areas. To give one example, Queen Maxima of the Netherlands has a role as a special advisor for the UN Secretary General on inclusive financing. And that's about ensuring that people, even in the poorest communities, for example, women who might want to start a small business, have access to microcredit and to small loans that will uh, enable them to do that. So I think you know we can talk about partnerships in a number of different spheres, including between, between developing countries. And similarly, I think we need to keep paying attention to the role of governments, both in meeting commitments to provide assistance, but also in helping other governments strengthen their own systems, their own capacity to generate their own revenue and invest in, in their own people's future. Uh, so I, I should pause right now uh, and uh, invite people to ask questions via Twitter using the hashtag MDGMomentum. You can hit me up with a question at Mark L. Goldberg or at UN Dispatch. Uh, and uh, Michael, it's interesting uh, that you brought up the, the uh, example of Korea uh, as the you know a country that had received assistance and is now an assistance giver. Uh, I know uh, Ban Ki Moon likes to a Korean national uh, likes to tell the story about how as he was growing up, you know the World Food Program fed him. He read UNICEF books and now he leads this this very organization. So his life is sort of a personal uh, example of that process. Um, but as we are sort of meant to talk about the MDGs in general, we also have to focus on MDG 1, which is a sub-theme of this particular panel. Uh, and one, uh, you know, MDG 1, which is to reduce by half the number of people living in extreme poverty, is a success story. It was, it was reached, uh, and it was reached early, I think something like five years ago. Uh, but one of the reasons it was reached was precisely because of the you know, incredible economic growth in Asia, in China, and in India over the last several years, one area lagging behind is Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and Michael, I wanted to ask you, what can be done to accelerate progress on the very first MDG in Sub-Saharan Africa? You know, we've achieved this as, hu as you know, humanity has achieved MDG 1, but there are still subsections that have yet to do so. <laughs> what can be done to accelerate progress? Sure, thanks Mark. I mean, first of all, I, uh, I, would, I would just take note that the fact, you're right, um, there's been enormous progress in uh, tackling extreme poverty and rates have been halved over the last 20 years. I would just say the fact that that has come about 
uh, in part through enormous economic growth in, in China, India, and other parts of Asia. You know, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Because, again, I think it reminds us that the role of international development assistance is one vital part of the picture, but it's only one. So I think part of the challenge if we look at other parts of the world is how can we help them achieve the same levels of economic growth, um, achieve development in sustainable ways. If you're turning to Africa, as you've done, the, again, let's keep in mind some really important positives on, on the continent. If you look at countries like Ghana, uh, Rwanda, Tanzania, uh, you know, enormous progress has been made. And across the continent, in areas like enrolling uh, girls in primary education, uh, in maternal mortality, one can find many, many examples of progress. That said, you're correct that there are huge challenges remaining in, in many bits of sub-Saharan Africa. A lot of those countries start from a very low base, you know, in terms of level of income, in terms of extreme poverty. In many cases, they've been particularly vulnerable to, to conflict uh, and, and natural disasters of other forms. I spent several years working in Sudan and on the challenges facing Darfur, South Sudan, other parts of the country like East Sudan. And we continue to see the effects of those you know, decades or centuries long challenges today. Um, you can find it outside Africa too, Afghanistan, where I've also worked being another example. But I think if we look to the future, the um, helping countries in sub-Saharan Africa invest in inclusive growth, that means providing opportunities for work, uh, for decent livelihoods, also investing in social safety nets, uh, that's got to be a key target. I mentioned energy earlier, and I think that's uh, really an area where Africa uh, needs a great deal of assistance. Uh, the U.S. is doing a lot of work in that area, um, and we applaud the role that the United States and other countries, including China, are trying to play. So I think we need to help African governments meet the same challenges that have been met successfully in some parts of Africa and in other parts of the world. And again, that's going to come about in part through cooperation between developing countries. So where we can support that, we'll seek to do so. Uh, so, Kathy, I saw you nod your head vigorously at the mention of energy access. <laughs> well, it's, it, it, Michael hit it right on the on the nose. Uh, it's it's such a it's amazing. It wasn't one of the original goals because it underlies every single one of them. You can find an energy component to education if kids can't study at night without light. Uh, healthcare if you can't deliver a baby safely in a hospital in the in the or a clinic uh, in the dark. It, and it's such an expensive proposition for so many of those countries that could be putting their revenues into uh, other other things that move us on that path from poverty to prosperity. So it's exciting that we're entering into an era when we think there's both cheap and efficient energy that can be available to these countries that can make a game changer of a difference between now and 2030. So the goal of, of universal access by 2030 is both real and imperative if we're going to make a difference. And I thought Michael also made a great point about resiliency in, in the conflict states. That's where we see the most stubborn, um, re repetitive forms of poverty. And, you know, I love that that's UNDP's um, subline is resilient nations because we've got to build that in so that we're not going back to square to uh, square one, ground zero, every time there's a conflict and we really help these countries uh, build from strength and that's often investing in women of course and so that's been a priority for us and, and I think it's been a really successful part of the goals. It's also interesting, I think sometimes we think about poverty by nations but you know there are ports, parts of Brazil or even more middle income countries that have really serious pockets of poverty that also will need to be addressed as, as we look forward. Um, so looking forward, not, not forward to 2030, but forward to 2015, uh, Kathy, uh, you know, in the short term, are there any like specific interventions that you would advocate between now and, you know, in the next 500 days of the international community just pour its energy and its money, its, its, its time into, to, you know, get as far towards the uh, end goal of the MDGs as possible? Well, I think everybody believes that the in the in the area of health that keeping the vaccine flow going is probably one of the most significant things we can do. If we can vaccinate more children, we can put them on a path to having that fifth birthday. If they can make it to their fifth, they often can survive. So that's a number one goal, and I think from the Gates Foundation to us to UNICEF, WHO, 
um, pushing, pushing, pushing to make sure we keep uh, through through the Gavi Alliance, through the Global Fund, those life-saving vaccines and other interventions like bed nets. So I think you're seeing a doubling down in those areas that are really essential. Uh, Ray Chambers, who's the special envoy for um, health finance, has been pushing for a plan for particularly the big countries like India and Nigeria to make really significant gains in the next 500 days. I, I think we also know that if you can prioritize girls, that makes a quantum um, improvement in what in what can be done in a very short period of time. So if you can keep a girl in school, prevent her from marrying too early, starting a family too early, you can also get to a, a poverty level that will be quite different. So I think those areas, and then finally, we're seeing so many uses for new technologies like the mobile phone, whether it's in giving health messages to, to women and pregnant uh, mothers, to using the mobile phone for ensuring that the aid that's being delivered is being done effectively and um, uh, there's good accountability. So we know there's a lot that can be done yet in these last 500 days. We just issued our own statement about what we're trying to do to make sure all the commitments we've made over the past few years are really being pushed through and I'm sure many other groups are doing that. So we can't take our eye off the ball while we're looking ahead to the next 15 years. We have 500 days to see how, how far we can get. Uh, and so, uh, uh, Michael, um, you know, without uh, taking our eye off the ball for the next 500 days, looking to the far future, looking to the uh, SDGs, you know, the, the process of creating the SDGs is still underway, but it looks as if that might include a goal of zeroing out poverty, extreme poverty, by 2030. Whereas the MDG that we're talking about, MDG 1, called for having extreme poverty by 2015, the SDG is calling for, probably calling for, zeroing out poverty by 2030. Michael, how audacious a goal is that? Uh, and from a perspective of UNDP, is that even achievable? Yeah, I think it is audacious, and I think it's necessary, and I think it's achievable. And if you look at uh, the record over the past couple of decades, as you say, halving extreme poverty uh, ahead of schedule, uh, I think that demonstrates the pace at which progress can be made. It's going to be tougher. You know, the first half of the target, is, almost by definition, is easier to achieve than the second half. But we've also learned a lot of lessons over the past couple of decades that can, that can help us get there. And that's many of the things that Kathy and I have talked about this morning, including the importance of partnerships, uh, not only with uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, with philanthropists and foundations like Gates, Turner, uh, others in other parts of the world like Mo Ibrahim's foundation, uh, but also the role of the private sector. So I think we need to keep all those lessons in mind as we go forward. I think it's going to take serious investment in areas like health, education, sanitation. You know, we've talked a lot about energy. Agriculture obviously remains an absolutely vital sector for many countries in the world. So those are the kind of things we need to focus on. I would, if I may, I'd just underline a couple of things, partly to pick up and echo um, things that Kathy has mentioned. I mean, one part of this is certainly about uh, the rights and the role of women. And, you know, Kathy made a wider point about continued inequality, even in countries that have been doing very well economically and which have seen huge economic growth, which we're glad to see and we want to continue. But sometimes within those countries, there remain huge challenges of, of inequality and very large numbers of poor people, even if the country as a whole is, is beginning to prosper. So a lot of that comes down to... Uh, how can we help in those areas? How can we support governments in their own efforts? Um, and a lot of the approaches need to start from a, a basic point about rights. For example, access to justice. Uh, that's an absolute vital area for women in many parts of the world. Um, and so rights-based approaches remain fundamental. I think if, you know, you've talked about the SDGs, uh, and again, in the same way the MDGs had a huge galvanizing effect over the last 15 years, allowing us to make the progress that has been made. Uh, similarly, with the SDGs, and if we're going to generate even more momentum and commitment to, er to eradicate extreme poverty uh, completely, uh, getting, the pro getting the SDGs right over the next year is absolutely key. And it's one area, if I may, just to talk a little bit about the role of the UN system. You know, we've rightly focused in this discussion on, on broader partnerships, which remain essential. But within that, I think the process of developing the Sustainable Development Goals, 
you know, the so-called post-2015 agenda for sustainable development. That's a great example of where the UN system, I think, plays an absolutely key role. Cathy touched earlier on the efforts that have been made to support the consultations between governments, and these are very much uh, negotiations and discussions between governments, between member states. But UNDP and other parts of the UN system have tried to support that, for example, by the process of consultations that Cathy described. And those have been happening in 50 or more countries around the world. They've been happening online through the My World campaign. And again, I want to applaud within that the role of the, uh, the Millennium Campaign, Corinne Woods and her colleagues. So all this activity intended, again, to draw attention to the challenges and generate a real feeling of engagement that people can offer their views um, on an individual level uh, to, to supplement uh, the negotiations going on between governments. And again, in terms of eradicating extreme poverty, let me just make, excuse me, Mark, just one last oh, point. Uh, yeah. Focusing, if I may, on you know, UNDP, I think, sees itself as playing a, a vital role in this effort with our partners in the UN system, you know, UNICEF, the World Health Organization, the other members of the UN Development Group, uh, the World Bank, and so on. Um, and within that, I think UNDP's focus will be primarily on how can we tackle that target of eradicating extreme poverty, and what is the work that is needed around that, not only to build the capacity of governments uh, to take forward their own people's prospects, um, but how can we help them to strengthen their systems of governance including rule of law and access to justice. And in particular, as Cathy said again, how can we help them strengthen their own resilience against crisis? Because very often that's what sets countries uh, off track, sets them back, and that might be conflict, it might be natural disaster, which we've seen in many parts of the world. So the, these focus areas, poverty, governance, resilience, I think will be crucial in, in achieving that target you, you talk about. Eradicate extreme poverty, certainly audacious, but also, in our view, certainly achievable. Uh, and, and, Kathy, I wanted to turn it to you for the final word on uh, the SDGs and, and sort of going forward in general uh, from, from your perspective, from the UN Foundation's perspective. Uh, what's, what's next in this conversation? Well, you know, we, we were honored that UNDP asked the UN Foundation to actually do a consultation, set of consultations in the United States. So we tend to think about these goals as goals for people somewhere else, but actually we engaged citizens in 13 communities to talk about how the goals actually affect Houston or Kansas City, and we have, we have issues. We have childhood hunger, we have higher mortality rates than should among women. We need to address these issues globally, so I think that's an interesting way to be thinking about the world we're all trying to create. The My World um, survey that has been going on online that, that Corinne Woods and, and the Millennium Campaign have done, we were really excited about supporting because it's also told us how people in every single country think about the goals applying to them in their lives. And, and they're not that different. I mean, education, health care, a responsive and, and good government really matter as much in the United States as in Tanzania. So we, we're learning a lot about ourselves as, as a world of citizens who share pretty common values. And then finally, I just want to say, I think, I think Michael hit it on the nose, achievable, audacious, and imperative. I mean, those are, those are sort of the watchwords, I think, for going forward as we talk about the goals. As you probably know, um, the so-called open working group of, of up to 90 member states have come up with a set of draft goals. The Secretary General now will create a synthesis report of everything that he's been hearing from his high-level panel to that process, to others who've contributed. And over the next year, governments and citizens around the world will be talking about the goals that they want to see and what plan they think can be put in place. And then we hope that in September 2015, we're going to push a button and everyone will know we have a plan going forward and we can rally behind it, hold our governments accountable, and see the difference that we want to have. So it's an exciting time to be part of our world because this is really our generation's opportunity. Thanks so much, Michael. Yeah, this uh, thank you both. This, this is, as you said, it's just a, a great moment. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a signature moment in history, in the history of the world that we're living in now in this transition between the MDGs and the SDGs. But the MDGs aren't over. Uh, and to follow the momentum all day long, uh, go to mdgmomentum.org. Use the hashtag MDGmomentum. Pardon me. 
mdg500.org. Use the hashtag mdgmomentum uh, to follow all the conversations. I'd like to thank Kathy uh, at the UN Foundation and Michael of the UN Development Program and the people at the UN Foundation for hosting this Google Hangout. Uh, and stay tuned for uh, an entire day, an entire 500 minutes of uh, events around the Millennium Development Goals. Thank you all, and uh, stay tuned for more action. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Thanks Bye. Mike. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Michael.